Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to this new webinar by the Global Plan Council. Today, we will talk about the scientific publishing system and very particularly about the peer review process, how it has changed along the time and why it is important. This is a topic of um, obvious interest for researchers in general, but particularly for early career researchers. And, and, that, and, and the topic has encountered recently, you might know some controversy. Uh, to, uh, to speak about this, uh, we have today with us Professor Wataru Sakamoto. Professor, uh, he is a professor at the Institute of Plant Science and Resources at the Okayama University in Japan. He has published more than 100 papers and has uh, also a wide experience in the review process of academic papers. He currently serves as editor-in-chief of the journal Plant and Cell Physiology, one of the society journals that is published uh, by the Japanese Society of Plant Bi uh, Physiologists since 1959. So um, uh, welcome, uh, thank you Wataru, thank you for being here today with us and the floor is yours. Microphone. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, good morning or good afternoon. Um, so uh, thank you for the introduction, Isabel, and uh, welcome to today's webinar on the changing landscape of peer review in plant science. Uh, I will be talking about why we have peer review for scientific publication and see how one can develop research career as a reviewer. Okay. Okay, um, first of all, let me introduce about myself. My name is Wataru Sakamoto, uh, currently professor at the Institute of Plant Science and Resources, as Isabel mentioned. And it is in uh, uh, Okayama University, uh, located in the Western part of Japan. Uh, having uh, spent my graduate work in Tokyo University and uh, postdoc in Cornell University, I have been in this, this institute as a faculty member for more than 25 years and study uh, mainly in chloroplast biogenesis and photosynthesis. So this is um, uh, my uh, Twitter account. So if you're interested, please take a look and follow me. Also, uh, currently uh, I'm serving as a chief editor of the journal called Plant and Cell Physiology. And PCP is, as, as Isabel mentioned, uh, is founded as an official journal of Japanese Society of Plant Physiologists. Uh, it's in 1959, so it has a more than 60 years of history. And currently published by the partnership with the Oxford University Press as an online journal. Uh, therefore, I should say that PCP is one of the plant science journals dedicated to the community. And I also have uh, this Twitter account for PCP where I uh, release newly published papers and so on every day. So if you're interested, please follow this account as well. And uh, uh, actually we have more than 25 editors engaged in the editorial processes. And uh, along with me, uh, there are five uh, senior editors and uh, 21 handling editors. That covers all areas of plant science and that represents the diversity of plant scientists from all over the world. And uh, okay, uh, one thing uh, I'd like to draw your attention as kind of advertisement is that uh, OUP now publishes many plant science societies journals that include, for example, plant cell and plant physiology from the American Society of the uh, is something wrong? Uh, is it working okay? Uh, the plant cell and the plant physiology from the American Society of Plant Biologists and also Journal of Experimental Botany from the Society for the Experimental Biology and the PCP uh, published from the uh, Japanese Society of Plant Physiologists. So uh, recently they showcased uh, uh, these journals at the so-called uh, OUP Plant Science Hub where the collection of articles in plant resilience and the sustainable plant production, uh, plant science to improve health and developing technology are assembled 
So if you're interested, please try to visit the website along with our, our, our PCP Twitter account. All right, uh, too much advertisement, but uh, let's come back to uh, today's topic. So let's take a look at why we have peer review for scientific publication. All right, so I have a couple of slides to give you a kind of context of peer review with my favorite sports, baseball. Many Japanese people uh, like to watch, enjoy watching baseball games, and we all know that the game was controlled by the licensed referee. Apparently, referee never get into the baseball game as a player, but judge based on the rule book and control the overall game. Um, therefore, I can say that uh, fair judgment is fundamental to assure game quality. And that what, you know, what this means is that uh, the professional games require professional referees. When you look at the scientific publication, that does not go in that way because a scientist can be both a player and a referee. So that we sometimes publish the paper as an author but at the same time, we serve as a referee to judge someone's manuscript. What this means is that uh, you, are, you are requested to become professional for both playing and reviewing. I can say that this is the concept of peer review. So fair assessment, uh, you know, uh, fair assessment is fundamental to secure quality assurance of scientific paper. And uh, uh, the peer review is believed to be the best practice to publish scientific findings. I would say in most of the cases, uh, you will start your research career by writing a paper for publication. And later on, you will learn to, you know, uh, how to review the article. So you might want to ask when you start the peer review articles and how you can develop your skills as a referee. So in this seminar, I will be looking at uh, these questions on peer review system. So hopefully you can understand that. Um, to get a hint on this question, um, I, let me introduce my brief history in publication and peer review as an author and reviewer. Uh, my research career goes back to uh, more than 30 years ago, and my first submission and publication as an author dates back to uh, 1988 when I was a PhD student, it was a long time ago. And at that time, I, I wrote the manuscript with the typewriter. So the submission was actually by the postal service. So it took very long, almost like a forever to publish. Um, then I, after spending several years uh, as a postdoc, and I got a position as assistant professor. And at this time, uh, I began to submit my paper as a corresponding author. Soon after that, I received um, a first invitation to review a paper as a referee. And since then, the time went on and uh, it becomes the, web, becomes the era of online submission around the year 2000. Then I began to receive a regular invitation to review. Not many, but something like a few per year. And eventually the invitation to review articles increased to something like around 20 per year. When I had more than 30 per year, then it makes me feel so overwhelmed and I started to decline a few and then pass it to my lab members for co-review. Uh, and later on, I was appointed as a monitoring editor of plant physiology and started to handle around 40 you know, papers and currently serving as a chief editor in PCP. And then I look at around 400 manuscripts per year. So from my experience, what I can say is that uh, you may get a first review invitation, let's say seven years after your first publication and 10 more years later, uh, you tend to receive more and the regular reviews and uh, five more years later, uh, you tend to receive, uh, sorry, uh, uh, five more years later, you will have an experience serving as an editor and handle submission together with the reviewers. So this is a kind of example uh, by me. Here I just summarized the uh, current status and the possible problems in scientific publication from the standpoint of authors and reviewers respectively. 
Uh, this flowchart simply shows how you prepare your manuscript and submit, and then it is reviewed and uh, made decision for publication, either request for revision and reject. Uh, many researchers are now eager to publish it in a high impact journal. So it often ends up with a repeated, repeated rejection and resubmission. As a result, there may be more and more reviewers needed actually, and we tend to receive many invitations to review articles. Okay, so the fact is that uh, authors face difficulty to publish because they want to publish in high rank journals, whereas, you know, we end up with receiving too many invitations for review articles. So those are kind of conflicts to be faced now. Okay. Um, Meanwhile, uh, there are other issues arising regarding scientific publication. Uh, for example, authors may have to pay expensive publication cost for published articles. Whereas if the paper is published in the journal that requires prescription to look, in such case, you will spend awfully a lot of time and money for publication, but ends up with limited accessibility. Also, there are many you know, repeated submission, and which means that uh, so many reviewers are needed, and we tend to receive invitation that exceeds your capacity. Okay, and uh, uh, here we simply look at how many reviews are actually needed to publish one paper nowadays. As mentioned in the previous slide, uh, there are two facts you can take into account here. Okay. So one is the online submission that is manipulated easily compared to like, you know, postal service so that you now, you know, uh, you can submit many times easily by online. Okay, um, then uh, as a consequence, we try to submit our paper to the high impact journal and cascade it into the other journals until accepted and published. So here I took a factor A as how many journals you submit, and uh, that resulted in you know, reiterated and lengthy submissions. For example, let's consider you know, two journals as factor A, and the factor B is the number of reviewers that we have, we have for, for one submission, and then typically we have two or three. So let's take two as a factor B, and furthermore, uh, the final submission may have a revision process where the same reviewer will take a look at the same paper. So here I put, let's say, two as a factor C. So, you know, the outcome would be something like, you know, we need uh, six reviewers needed to publish one paper, right? So I'm not sure if you consider this number is too many or not, but the numbers may be more if you submit to many journals, okay? So we have many, many reviewers needed for one publication. So as a result of these situations, we have several matters arising. So I summarized these here. Uh, first of all, uh, lengthy review period. So we have lengthy review period so that you know, you, we feel it takes almost forever to publish. Uh, this concern now leads to the new development of pre-submission system, uh, something like a bioarchive. So I will be talking a little bit about it more and more. But and secondly, you know, people are reluctant to review. So are there anything good for us? Uh, actually, there is, you know, some system here uh, to accredit, accredit the reviewers and some journals actually have journal miles. So those are, those could become a part of your, your career if you accumulate those accreditation so that now we have some system to acknowledge, you know, your review process. And finally, um, um, there is an ethical issue regarding data manipulation and plagiarism. So the reviewers are now requested to you know, surveillance such data contents. And uh, in the later part of my talk, I will be uh, you know, touching on those issues a little bit one by one. So here um, we will look at the actual change in the peer review system, including preprints and some of the emerging activities in open science. Uh, this is an example of preprints uh, by archive. And as mentioned, a lengthy and then reiterated peer review leads to the development of preprints now. 
And as shown in this graph, the rise of preprints deposited to the preprint servers have an unprecedented increase, as let's say since five years ago. Uh, needless to say, preprint server is where you can publish your publish your your manuscript without peer review. Uh, that allows a swift publication and free access and uh, avoid scooping all your research findings. And also you may get you know, free feedbacks as a comments and improve your work before real submission to the peer review journals. Uh, recently, uh, most of the journal actually confirmed that preprints can be cited as a reference and many journals have a direct transfer system, uh, direct transfer system from the preprint server, which means that uh, most of the journal actually accept preprints for submission. And uh, uh, only one thing that, uh, that is arising now is the convergence of citations in the same work published as preprint and peer review journals, because sometimes the linkage between those two uh, papers is somewhat not clear at the end. But anyway, uh, reprint, preprints are becoming more and more general strategy as a part of manuscript submission, as we can find in this slide. All right, so um, in the following couple of slides, um, I like to uh, show you the type of peer review system in, in the journals, okay? Uh, as you can see here, uh, peer review can be modeled by different kinds of manuscript type, identifiability and handling system and the publication of peer review comments. And maybe I explain it one by one. And also now, uh, as I mentioned uh, repeatedly, uh, that, you know, almost all journal now accept submission through preprint servers like BioArchive, right? So first, uh, this manuscript type means whether a submitted manuscript is uh, just not published anywhere or pre-publication -publi pre through the uh, preprint server, but not post-publication. So the you know, paper should not be published anywhere else, but the preprint can be acceptable. And uh, next, uh, identifiability means whether the authors and reviewers are blinded or not. And the next one, a uh, handling system means the way of handling, and it will be completely mediated by handling editors. Uh, whereas the, there is a system in which the journal allows some communication between the you know, editors, reviewers, and even authors. Okay. And finally, uh, the publication of peer review comments means that, uh, you know, um, depending on the journals, peer review themselves uh, may or may not be published along with the accepted papers, where reviewers' identity is clarified or kept anonymous, okay? So as a result, uh, we can combine almost any one of these options to implement peer review. That's why we have so many systems now, and then, you know, this is different in each journal. So to simplify my talk here, let's consider the peer review system we have in PCP. So PCP accepts not only the new manuscript preprints directly submitted from the authors, but also through preprint server. So now we have a system called the B2J so that you just submit the paper to preprint server, but directly transfer it from there to PCP. Um, for identify, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the manuscript type. So the, for identifiability, uh, PCP is a single blinded Okay, single blinded. So what this means is that the reviewers see the author's name on the reviewing manuscript, but the authors do not know who the reviewers are. Okay, for the handling system, uh, PCP heavily relies on the final evaluation of handling editors based on the review comments from the reviewers. Okay, but recently uh, the online communication tool is highly encouraged to use to accelerate communication within the editors. So in case of PCP, we only have a communication system within the editors, but uh, uh, including reviewers. 
Uh, finally, uh, the manuscript will be accepted by the editors, but we do not make review comments open publicly. Overall, uh, one thing I'd like to point out here is that uh, while many combinations exist within the journals, as I mentioned, uh, submission via preprint server becomes a main platform for submission so that we should be more and more aware of preprint. All right, so uh, now uh, coming back to the task of reviewer, and then I ask why you would have to serve as a reviewer here. It is a volunteer-based service, but uh, sort of mandatory. So here I can call this as a professional responsibility, and it is to serve for your community and to strengthen your community of the researchers. You can ask yourself, you know, how does my review make my community stronger? And is it, uh, there's an option for a core review system to encourage you know, young scientists? Or it would be a good opportunity to help train your students or postdocs. And also it is important to consider that uh, this is a great opportunity for your uh, uh, professional development. So uh, it will help you to understand the weakness of your own paper and become a better author. Given this obligatory load, uh, you may consider that the experience in review becomes a part of a career, your career evaluation. So as I mentioned, so is there anything good for serving as a reviewer? So this is an example uh, in PCP, so that uh, here I'd like to introduce a uh, accreditation system uh, offered by Pablo. And this uh, PCP has ab adopted it since a couple of years ago. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to uh, mention about a core review system. So after contributing to review in PCP, your review track will ask you if you are assisted with someone uh, close to you. Uh, when accepting an invitation to review from PCP, uh, we very much encourage you to co-review together with uh, early career researchers like a postdoc. By doing so, we give an opportunity to serve as a referee along with the supervisors. And furthermore, this track uh, will ask you if you want to get accreditation record from Pablo. So you can simply click here, yes. Then uh, this means that uh, your review records can be visible at your Pablo profile, similar to the publication record. And later on, this can be exploited to your research career development. To make uh, volunteering reviews more visible and acknowledgeable, uh, I would recommend you to consider these kind of options in your next occasion of peer review in PCP, for example. And I, I assume that uh, there are similar systems you know, in, in the other journals, so that now and now, now more and more, you know, those uh, could become visible as a part of the career development. Okay, so the other thing I'd like to point out here is, is the awareness of ethical matter during peer review. Uh, as mentioned, uh, ethical issue in scholarly publishing is becoming more and more serious. No matter how it happens as a result of simple errors or intentional misconducts or flow, there are a number of concerns that can be raised during peer review process and some of them may be caused by carelessness of the author, but some may be serious misconducts, which are often difficult to detect. Regardless of what it is, um, those can be identifiable with the so-called post-publication peer review process, and the outcome would be something like an expression of concern or uh, corrections, and in the worst case, maybe the, you know, a retraction retraction may be imposed. To avoid such situations after publication, it would be ideal that the reviewers can, for example, check the quality of presented data and their integrity. In occasion of en you know, encountering such cases, most journals now follow the guideline developed by the committee called on, on ethics called a COPE. So we follow this COPE guideline uh, because of the limited time, I don't have time to discuss about this in detail, but I, I would like you to keep in mind that 
the current reviewers might have to pay attention to these facts as a referee. All right, um, so in this uh, final part, um, I will be looking at the actual reviews and show um, how uh, show you, you some practice to become a better reviewer from my experience. So there are several tips I would suggest to you. Here I briefly mentioned these. Yeah, okay. First of all, note the deadline and say no or recommend others if you are too busy. While I highly encourage you to contribute to review, it is acceptable to decline the review invitation. Instead of putting it in your email box forever, you may say simply no and I recommend other potential reviewers. It is uh, important to carefully read the reviewer guidelines and understand what the journal wants. For example, commercial journals and the journals for society may have a different scope. So you have to be careful about the scope of the journal. Be intentional. Um, you should evaluate the research for aspects such as originality or appropriateness and the relevance. Please do not comment on formatting or suitability for publication. Be objective, but not subjective. Uh, your evaluation is, should be based on the fact with detailed and specific comments, but not giving your own opinion. Be bold and uh, constructive to make a decision. So, you know, needless to say, don't give any feedback you you do not want to receive. Clearly state if you request additional experimentation or not, and this will be the important part to make a decision of resubmission or revision. And finally, it is fine to express the good point of the paper. So you are not making the simple judgment of you know, yes or no as a policeman. If you feel that work is nice, just give it in your comments and then it is okay to find that the paper is good. You can mention it as a reviewer. Right, so um, here, let's take a look at the actual online page where you input your comments uh, as an example in PCP. Uh, the current system is called the Scala 1. So in this Scala 1 system, you will be asked to, you know, about recommendation, uh, whether it is acceptable, request revision or decline or encourage resubmission and so on. So there are two windows here. Uh, one is the only one for the editor. And this is optional and you don't need to write, but it is helpful if you can give some confidential comments such as suitability for publication and something like, you know, um, I have reviewed this paper when I submitted to the other journal. And I know these authors group and they generally perform you know, solid work or some other information helpful to evaluate the paper. So this is a confidential part. And the bottom window is where you put your comment to authors. Those are the one you see as an author. Okay, so uh, I just have a couple of slides at the end. Uh, just, uh, I like to show the actual review example from my experience. So in other words, this is an example of my own comments as a reviewer. So, um, uh, the, the, the paper related to this review actually de describes the molecular cloning of the gene involved in some plant species. Because it is not the model plant and the mutant has been well known for a long time. So I thought the work is publishable, but uh, requested several additional experiments. Uh, typically, my review comment begins with a brief statement of what the paper described not very long, but concise enough to summarize the content. My style to mention the good point of the book here is exemplified in this highlighted one. So I just mentioned that it is exciting to see this long-standing something has been uncovered by solid evidence, something like this. And it is followed by the general comments where I state the significance and originality and appropriateness and the relevance. And here I particularly draw the author's attention regarding the issue of whether I request additional experimentation or not for the revision. So I mentioned that the work, work is solid um, and then agree with the conclusion 
but uh, I did not completely agree with the G model in the manuscript. So I deliberately requested to check the cDNA sequence here. So this is a kind of like a minimum request to be improved before publication. And in addition, I, I, the manuscript proposed the cellular localization of the protein that is different from those reported in the previous work. So I simply requested authors to uh, further you know, check this localization. So I said that in my opinion, this is not appropriate and that this should be tested with something. Okay, so I would say that this is a kind of like a minimum request for the you know, publication. So you have to make clear that, you know, this kind of uh, things to be done in the revision. Overall, my comment is like, although I appreciate the solid work from the authors, I requested to additional experiments to support the work, which the author later agreed and then revised it and then finally published. Uh, one thing, um, uh, I'd like to emphasize here is that uh, I typically write my comment, which does not exceed 1,000 words, that is equivalent to about two pages. So in my opinion, you should not write the lengthy comments that might confuse the author. So rather, I prefer the concise comment, which may be around 500 to 1,000 words. Okay, this is another example of my review comments. And the manuscript dealt with uh, uh, biochemistry of some protein and authors have done in vitro analysis. And I mostly agree with the contents, but the, some of the points were not clear. Again, uh, I have a brief summary of the work at the beginning here. And then I admire this work so that uh, this work tackle to clarify something something. But while the experiments are well organized and the interpretation looks reasonable, I have several concerns that the author needs to address before publication. So you need to clarify something like this. Um, yet I was not, you know, um, so yeah, uh, I always acknowledge the solid work by stating that the experiment was well organized or something like this. And also in this comment, I clearly state uh, that, uh, yeah, I did not agree. So sometimes you can use the word, strong word, like I did not agree. And in my style, I also use the sentence end ending with a question mark like here. So I'm asking also, I did not agree, but I just ask, you know, am I correct about this? So this kind of, you know, you know mild and, my comments. Um, so I, I usually use these kind of uh, comments. And I also, I clearly state what kind of additional things that authors should you know, address in, in the red part here, okay? So for example, here I clearly requested that, that there are two points to the author that the author should answer in the revised manuscript. Overall, this comment is about 700 words. So again, I would prefer the concise review that does not exceed 1,000 words. So anyway, my final message is that uh, there is no particular style for review comments so that you need to establish your own way. However, uh, there may be several tips to write comment beneficial for assessing the submitted manuscript. So I hope some of the points I mentioned here may be useful for future occasion as a reviewer, right? So I hope you enjoy and understand what I wanted to tell you here for the context of peer review and how you can polish your comments as a reviewer. Why we have peer review for scientific publication and peer review incorporates open science now and the practice to become a reviewer as I mentioned, okay? So peer review is important advance your career as a researcher in the science community. And hopefully you would become a and become to enjoy your role not only as an author but also as a reviewer. Okay, so this leads to the end of my talk, and I would be happy to take any questions. Am I doing okay for time? Thank you very much. It's perfect. Regarding time, it was perfect. Thank you, thank you, Wataro. Thank you. It was eye-opening for me, at least. Uh, especially, it was especially clear, and I, I was really 
um, welcome uh, that the, the you um, presented these very clear examples of, of how to how to write a successful and useful uh, review for the authors uh, you were um, presented in the last slides. And also I think it's, uh, it was uh, great, your tips for becoming a good reviewer. It's uh, uh, particularly of interest uh because um i mean we have all seen the many memes about uh, the reviewing process that are um, run around in, a, in in twitter especially in the social media about the many uncomfortable situations that authors have faced with reviewers and also the opposite side of reviewers that uh, have felt that are very um too much judge or and justify we will judge for their reviews so now we welcome the rest of the of the of the panel today we have with us uh, two representatives of uh, of uh, the of the of two different journals that I have uh, uh, kindly accepted to be here in this panel and also to discuss uh, the publishing system and the reviewing system we have with us uh, Mila Efrenova, the journal manager for Frontiers in Plant Science. I think you, I'm going to give you uh, permission for sharing your... Yes, I cannot share my video. Yeah, I, I think you can now. And also, and also we have with us uh, Bennett Young, who is the managing editor for Plants, People, Planet. So the first, uh, first, I will uh, give you both the floor uh, to introduce yourself uh, more thoroughly, and also your journal. What's your scope? The scope of your journal uh, is it a commercial or a society, uh, society related journal? So uh, just that uh, we all know uh, who you are, who you represent. So first, uh, Mila. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. I had today some issues uh, with the internet. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for organizing this webinar. Uh, the Global Plan Council is doing an amazing job um, organizing and uh, helping us to learn more about uh, publishing and plant science and best practices. And thank you so much, Professor Sakamoto, for this amazing overview all around uh, peer review process. It was really a pleasure to listen to your presentation. And um, I would like to yeah, say a few words about the journal I am representing and uh, also the, uh, a few words about the period process uh, in our uh, uh, publishing house. So my name is uh, Ludmila Efremova, uh, or you can also call me Mila. I'm the journal manager for Frontiers in Plant Science. Uh, it's an open access journal around 14 years old. Um, yeah, and it's been doing a tremendous success. Uh, growing and uh, uh, every year uh, in terms of publications and editorial board. And we, of course, would like to, we are on a mission to make all science open and it's important for us to, um, to actually grow and uh, attract uh, publications and editors and through our journal, make it open faster. So producing plant science is uh, covering a lot of different areas. We have 24 special sections. You can find home for all papers you can imagine. And as uh, what I want to say about the peer review is that um, we are using a lot uh, uh, the artificial intelligence to uh, check um, and run 20 quality checks on every single paper in seconds. And we can check, for example, uh, image manipulation, plagiarism, uh, English language quality. So all the non-scientific parameters, which is really hard to, for editors to analyze and for reviewers also to spot uh, because you don't have tools. Uh, so we use a lot of technology to empower us, empower editors uh, to uh, have this high quality peer review. Uh, in regards to peer review process, it's of course changing a lot uh, in the past uh, 10 years, a lot of Changes, of course, we also rely on COPE guidelines uh, and uh, introduce new um, technology and systems helping us to do it uh, with a rigorous, transparent, uh, high quality. And uh, what I like particularly in your presentation, Professor Sakamoto, that you mentioned 
how important it is to be a review editor, or uh, later on you can be also promoted to associate editor. Uh, and um, it's important to bring your knowledge uh, to contribute to scientific community in this way as well. Also become visible, uh, network, collaborate, uh, see the, the latest research, uh, improve uh, your own uh, kind of experience as an author as well. So there are many uh, beneficial points uh, to be a reviewer, to be an editor, and help the scientific community thrive even more. Uh, yeah, that's what I was to, to mention from my side. Yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to ask and reach out anytime. Thank you, Mila. So Bennett, your turn. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to uh, join this webinar. So my name is Bennett Young. I'm managing editor for Plants People Planet. Uh, Plants People Planet is an open access journal. Uh, we're relatively new, we're about four years old now. And uh, what we're interested in is uh, plants, plant-based research, plant-focused research with impact on people, society, and the planet. So we're particularly interested in cross-disciplinary research and some cross-disciplinary approaches. So hopefully I'll be able to provide a bit of insight about how we peer review that sort of work um, as, a, as a sort of a, a bit of a un unique feature. And we've got some considerations around how we go out handling cross-disciplinary papers. Uh, Plantsville Planet is owned by an organization called the New Phytologist Foundation, which is a, a charitable foundation, a bit like a, an academic society. We've got a community of people who, who we serve uh, for as, as, as sort of a, an organization. And the ethos of the foundation is really to support the global plant science community through organizing meetings and providing um, you know, we do an annual uh, prize called the, the Tansy Medal and we provide travel grants and do all sorts of all sorts of things uh, behind the scenes. And uh, they, we published, they published two journals, uh, New Phytologist, which a lot of you might have heard of. It's a journal which is well established, been going for over 100 years. And Plants People Planet is a sort of relatively new, new sort of baby we've developed at the journal. And um, yeah, I suppose in terms of peer review, just to touch on some of the points of the others, we conduct a single uh, blind peer review, so fairly standard process that most plant science journals seem to kind of adopt, but obviously there are lots of discussions going out there about different approaches and different ways of doing things. Um, and I think I'll, I'll leave it there for now. I'm just kind of keen to see what questions people have and do my best to, to provide some insight. Thank you, Bennett. So I will be moderating this conversation. It's not, uh, I don't think it's a uh, um, um, uh, I don't think because many of you have been uh, here uh, several times that uh, I need to uh, go too deep about how how to send your questions. So there are different di there are different options. You can write them directly on the chat. That was the the, the easiest. Also, you can use the uh, question and answer feature. Uh, in fact, already someone has used it, so we will go with this first question. And then if you are not shy, you can raise your hand and I will give you the floor and you can ask the question directly using your microphone. So uh, we have a first question from Risco. Uh, I think this question is for uh, Professor Sakamoto. What do you think if the preprint is not acceptable in our country's scientific community, Professor, it seems that this kind of publication is still not popular. Thank you. Um, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if there is any screening for looking at the preprints at the preprint server. Um, mm -hmm. I have no experience on it and uh, uh, I'm not sure specifically, you know, how this can be screened, um, right? I mean, mm -hmm. If someone can comment on it, uh, mm -hmm. so um, there, should, there should be no regulation to look at uh, you know preprints in you know, a preprint servers unless there should be some kind of you know uh, shutting down kind of control for it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, if I can, I, I mean, I have just a very minor experience using preprints, and mm -hmm. then they they had a, a kind of a not not that extensive screening. But they, you have a, they, they screen your paper and, and they, uh, uh, for plagiarism, I assume, I, I don't know, uh, maybe they are using a, a tool similar to the, the uh, Mila has mentioned of, uh, of um, artificial intelligence. And uh, because it's not published 
um, automatically. It, 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 uh, you have to wait, I think, 24 to 48 hours, something like that. But uh, maybe, uh, yeah, Bennett? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was hoping to <laughs> just uh, say a few points after you finished, Isabel. So, no, um, I was already finishing. So, oh, okay, that, that's good. I was, I was just going to say that, you know, um, preprints are sort of relatively new development in the publishing world. And, uh, you know, the certain communities and certain regions of the world are probably ado adopting these new practices more that's quickly, cool. maybe, than others. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think a lot of journals are still finding their footing with handling preprints as well. So we're all sort of learning together how to sort of navigate this mm. new world. And um, I mean, I can't speak for other journals, but for Plants, People, Planet and New Phytologist, um, it, you know, it's not like a mandatory thing that an author has to submit to a preprint. It's entirely optional for an author to submit to a preprint if they want. We're, we're just happy to receive works which have been submitted to those, um, those sort of repositories before peer review. Um, so it's really a sort of a decision on the author's point of view, I'd say, unless there's any particular uh, mandate that they have from their institution or a funder which might sort of require it, it to go into a preprint. Uh, but I'm not aware of, of anything like that. Um, mm. So that, that's just a point to make. You know, it's a new development. So different different disciplines will probably adopt these things faster than others. And um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Something to add, Mila? I totally agree with Bennett uh, saying that it's something new and always when there's something new, uh, there is a certain kind of uh, resistance from maybe scientific community and it's something new and we are careful about it, this new article uh, type and the way of publishing because it's not and uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's always um, uh, something new uh, coming our way. But I what I recommend you is to promote your own research yourself. Uh, via different channels, because I believe every preprint has a DOI and still any kind of identificator, which you can promote your own research and make it acceptable. It's up to the scientific community and individuals uh, to make this um, new normal or also valuable source of information. Of course, it's up to uh, researchers to evaluate this research and see if they, um, uh, what, what they think about the, any particular paper, because it's not peer reviewed. Uh, but I would recommend you and every individual to promote your own research. Um, you can still cite it. You can still start to spread it uh, to become normal in the future. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yes. Um, yes. So I think uh, a preprint is getting you know popular and popular anyway. But the issue arising, for example, is that uh, there is a social problem for the preprints nowadays in the time of COVID nineteen. So that uh, many researchers now tend to publish, you know, uh, you know, before uh, reviewed papers to bioarchive, and then if that hits, you know, media, for example, and then just, you know, some of the preliminary work is just spread out through media, and then you have to be quite cautious about this kind of activities. So the peer review is the process that you know could be the best practice for our scientific publications. So we have to keep in mind that first of all, this peer review has to exist, but the preprint has certain benefits for it in terms of fast publication mm -hmm. and uh, you know, avoiding scooping of the findings, but uh, you really have to be cautious about that. That's my opinion. And also uh, we have discussed about this in our journal, so that whether or not this, uh, referenced uh, paper from bioarchive can be you know, accepted as, as a reference. And then uh, we used to have a criteria that uh, we just leave it that problem to the authors. If the authors want to leave it on, we say, okay, but there is no you know, rejection about uh, citation of those uh, bioarchive papers. But now I think most of the paper now accept bioarchive papers as a reference. I think if you, I'm, I'm right about your, your journals, <laughs> uh, but uh, that creates another problem for, for a scientific career development because you know, some of them would cite bioarchive papers for citations, and then some of them would cite the same work in a published paper. So the citation just is spread out. So there's need for merge it into one line for the researchers. You know, there could be some kind of disadvantage for the researchers. So I think I believe that this is the kind of things that uh, journals should work on in the, in the, in the future. Mm -hmm. So this is not the matter of my, my 
you know, this is not my business as a scientist, but anyway, uh, those kind of things, many things could, you know, rise as a result of, you know, popularity of, of uh, preprints. Mm -hmm. I totally, totally agree. I think we have answered this question. Um, I want to uh, pose a question also for, I think it, this is something that uh, ha, um, has been explained about, about plants in cell physiology, the, the journal by, by Professor Sakamoto. But I want to ask Mila and Bennett about um, uh, do you offer guidelines uh, the same way that the guidelines for authors are offered in every journal? Do you offer as well uh, guidelines for reviewers in your journal? And if so, what do beside that, what do you offer? What do you offer to your authors in order to uh, to your reviewers in order to uh, make it more attractive? to be a reviewer, because this is a voluntary voluntary work. And it takes a lot of time. And, and how do you attract their interest in, in working with you in that, in that profile? So who wants to start? Okay, I'll, I'll go there. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for that, Isabel. <laughs> Quite a lot to sort of unpack there. Um, so from our point of view, uh, so I, I want to touch on the cross-disciplinary aspect for us, because I think that's something unique that we can bring to the discussion in, um, you know, in, in, in terms of handling peer review for cross-disciplinary work, um, you know, we would communicate quite clearly the sort of cross-disciplinary scope of the journal. So when a reviewer accepts a, a review request for us and they, they, they go onto our online system, uh, we use the same system as, uh, as Professor Sakamoto flagged earlier, uh, scholar on manuscripts and we, we have uh, guidance on that system so it's all in one place when someone sits there in front of the screen to complete the review for us uh, the guidance is, is laid out for them um, so we provide clear guidance around our sort of formats as well so as a the kinds of work we consider as a journal uh, we're quite flexible on formatting uh, so mm -hmm. for instance we, we've published pieces from social scientists uh, of relevance to the plant science community and and we, we publish sort of narr more narrative type formats of research articles rather than a more traditional scientific uh, format of uh, instruction, uh, material methods results discussions. We do this sort of more narrative style of writing. So we, we kind of explain th those sorts of nuances, I suppose, um, around, around formats and what's allowable. Uh, so re reviewers are sort of clued up before they, they start reviewing for us. We encourage people to, to do joint reviews as well. Um, so that's great for, for mentoring uh, sort of early career researchers. And there's, there's, there's a sort of box to can tick online to sort of do that. Uh, we appreciate it when people sort of disclose any like limitations to their expertise. So this is really quite important for cross-disciplinary disciplinary work because you might have a paper, for instance, where it's a plant scientist who's teamed up with a philosopher or, I don't know, a, a, um, an ecologist has teamed up with a, a mathematician or an economist or something. And it's unlikely you're going to get any single reviewer who can judge all those different aspects of that work. So we try and approach the, the right blend of reviewers for each paper to, to, to kind of tick all the boxes of the different aspects the paper covers. And we, we've sort of asked the reviewers to disclose any limitations to their expertise. Some could say, you know, I'm really quite comfortable with the social science elements of this paper, but the kind of molecular biology or plant science elements I can't really comment on. So we'll get other reviewers to look at those aspects in more, more detail for us. Um, and then when people appear reviewing for us, the, the, we provide uh, sort of checklists and score lists that they can work through systematically to make sure they've kind of mm -hmm. uh, checked through all the bits and pieces we, we would ask them to, to consider as, as a reviewer. So a, a unique feature for Plants People Planet is something called the Societal Impact Statement. And this is just a short 100 word statement that sits above the abstract on the title page of paper. So it's a really bold, uh, it's a really bold kind of place, um, upfront place in a paper. And, you know, we're hoping with those that it provides a really snapshot of the, the take on message of the work, the wider implications of it, what impact it could have on policy and, and the world and society. And um, we try to encourage authors to write these in, in sort of, um, in, in, in sort of uh, plain language so that okay. non-experts, even the mem the staff have asked them as well reviewers, so when they're doing the work, they can bear those considerations in mind and, and sort of provide constructive comments around that. So 
that's that's sort of what I'd say about how we handle peer review as across this across this brain journal in terms of what reviews get out of it. Um, you know, really helping to sort of contribute to the wider scientific endeavor. If you want to look at the real big picture, you know, in terms of um, being able to read cutting edge research and help shape it and provide your expert input, there's something really valuable and, and I think quite nice to, to sort of contribute to that process. Um, at Plants People Planet, we're trying to build a, a real community around the journal. We're shortly going to be advertising for early career researchers to join us in an editorial advisor role. Um, and these will be on the, the editorial board. And we'll, we'll use the ideas for editorial advisors to be able to support editors by providing their expertise. But we also want to provide opportunities for editorial advisors, editorial advisors to get more insight into what it's like to work for a journal and to provide opportunities for them to um, work on some you know, fun projects for us. And um, you know, which will hopefully kind of um, to, you know, help them network, expand their horizons, the you know, so there's lots of possibilities around around that particular kind of role. So, uh, yeah, just to flag a few things from that point of view, I'll let Miller take over now. <laughs> Pamela? Yeah, just briefly, uh, since I guess we don't have a lot of time, but um, I wanted to mention that we do have also a of guidance and my advice to review agents who would like to start their editorial activity, uh, check all these guidelines and ask internal editorial team where to find information. It's, it's really crucial and important before you start to know what are the guidelines, what are the valid criteria for acceptance and rejection, where I can find them before I start to review or edit paper. And we do have, uh, of course, company policy. And also every journal is unique. Uh, every field is unique. And there are guidelines from the, uh, from the journal also, what is specifically needs to be considered and kept in mind uh, when you review. In terms of um, benefits, of course, we do have different discounts if a uh, reviewer would like to publish with us. Also different ways of excellence in reviewing. The most active and excellent reviewers can uh, request a certificate and uh, also promotions to an age position later on, uh, depending on, on the uh, how long uh, they've spent in seniority um, criteria. Uh, we can offer also promotions to an age position. So just in a nutshell, um, yeah, there are guidelines and there are definitely benefits, uh, more tangible benefits uh, in addition uh, to many others which you might have. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We have, uh, we have a question in our uh, here from Sadar Sadiki. Uh, what about short communication? I don't know uh, what, uh, what Sadar means exactly. Maybe the, he means that what about Share communication. Are there are there a review in the same way as a, a as a proper article, or they, they have a, a different a different process in your in your journals? Um, yes, um, my understanding is that perhaps uh, short communication uh, can be publishable for preprint, and maybe answer is yes. Any mm -hmm. kind of publication can be accepted in the preprint servers. Mm -hmm. And what else? <laughs> short communication. Um, regarding short communication, PCP uh, just gave up accepting short communication because uh, it is just a short version of the manuscript. And then we, mm -hmm. rather, we rather like to accept more, more kind of like a full research paper. And uh, uh, I think Frontiers, uh, Mira maybe, Frontier has a short, short communication or a sh they, they accept shorter manuscript. Yeah, we call it a brief communication or brief. Yeah, we have this particular article type and the preview process is different for every article type. Depends if it's a review, mini review, opinion paper. Uh, it varies from article type uh, to article type, but um, yeah, we do have this uh, format as well. Uh, it's quite, it's not an extensive one. It's a really brief. Uh, Type of article, and I, if I'm not mistaken, it, it doesn't require two reviewers, but one uh, is enough to evaluate. Uh, yeah, and an editor as well. So. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, we do publish a brief, a brief uh, sort of short format called brief report. Um, we we peer review them in the same manner that all our other papers really. Um, if there's sort of a particular uh, drive to sort of try to 
accelerate the peer review process for it, that the results are really, really timely, or you know, it could um, impact on, on sort of a, I don't know, a, a world event, which is really current or something, and we might want to get that uh, piece out quickly, then we can, we can look to try and accelerate the peer review process by uh, approaching sort of reviewers who are within our community with expertise who can comment. So for instance, the editorial advisor role I mentioned before, um, but that, that'd be quite a sort of rare occasion. Most of the short commu communications we receive are just peer review as normal. Hmm. Thank you. So we are over time. So I, I first of all, I want to ask uh, the, um, uh, the members of the panel if you are willing to stay a little longer or if you have to, if you have to leave. A <laughs> few minutes fine, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I have, I, I have um, a couple of questions, but uh, maybe I, I'm just going to uh, go to the, uh, to the more controversial issue, maybe, that, would, that is the ethical issues that has uh, uh, Professor Sakamoto very well introduced and that are a big problem, uh, especially, especially now, uh, probably with the, with, the, uh, with the new environment that includes, uh, that has opened because of open science, that open science is, uh, is uh, it's obviously a good thing but it has also opened the, uh, the door to predatory journals and also practices that, uh, that involve the print print servers. So how do you, how do you uh, fight these ethical issues? How do you make, do you have a surveillance system that, to, uh, uh, that goes through the, 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 the papers that are submitted but also the papers that have been submitted in the past uh, and, 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 and they appear to have uh, some of these issues that only are evident later after published. How do you deal with this? So who maybe, wants to go first? Ataru? Maybe, okay. Um, <laughs> regarding uh, some kind of misconducts, first of all, let's say plagiarism. Uh, there is a, some kind of software to, to you know, catch it on. And uh, the famous one is called Authenticate, I think, mm -hmm. so that you can just deposit that file and then see if there's any kind of, you know, duplicated sentences or so, something like that. Uh, Mira mentioned that uh, there may be a particular system that uh, a Frontier uh, adopted it, I guess. Um, I had a, one paper published very recently in Frontier in Plant Science, so I, I knew that <laughs> they have a good system. But for us, in the era of open science, probably the most important point for this kind of misconduct is to share the original data somewhere. So that the transparency for the original data is, is very, very important. So in PCP, what we do is that we request the authors to have a statement called the data availability. So that uh, it's not the requirement, but uh, we encourage the authors to deposit the original data regarding the published paper to the kind of like a public domains so that uh, they can look back and check. So this kind of transparency is gonna become quite important for the publication. I'm not sure if the other journals, you know, have special systems, but uh, nowadays more and more it's getting popular that, uh, you know, some data for like, uh, images or you know just a, you know big data for the for the you know genome analysis or something maybe we need to share this information on the public side that's what i think thank you so yeah, yeah, as you mentioned, open science is one of the way to go, as we can see in the future. It does make sense to keep papers behind paywalls. But the major criticism is that um, many journals, which are excellent, consider to be predatory. So, and that's why the strong focus should be on peer review to make it rigorous, transparent. And that is what we are actually focus on a lot uh, to ensure that the peer review process is really, really strong and um, uh, rigorous at the same time. We check paper before it comes, as I said, 20 quality checks during the period process is quite um, strict and also after safe net, uh, whatever might still be um, not um, high quality, we still uh, catch it at the end as well. 
and uh, apologies, there is a doorbell. And uh, what I also wanted to mention that uh, in terms of transparency, uh, we disclose the name of reviewers and editors on the paper after it's been accepted, for example, to make it transparent uh, as well. So there are several steps uh, throughout the peer review process to keep it uh, thorough, rigor, high quality, and uh, transparent at the same time. So to avoid this kind of predatory um, connotation when you talk about uh, open access and open access journals, that mm -hmm. more rigorous peer review process, the, the stronger your position is, and the more people trust this new model. Bennett? Yeah, these are big, big questions. And, you know, I think, I think any system where there's, there's people involved, uh, there's going to be um, times where, where things don't go, go quite uh go, go well quite as plans shall we say and and problems emerge and um you know i think it's worthwhile making the point that you know this is this is a problem that not just journals and publishers can can solve it's really a community wide uh global issue and you know we need to think about what what's the driver behind these these sorts of problems these sort of ethical problems um you know what what pressures people are under i suppose to publish and and what are the the, the incentives around publication of papers um and, and, and so that you know, how can how can people have better maybe mentorship in terms of how to construct papers and how to properly sort of carry out experiments so uh, things are done, done as you know best practice and you know uh, it's correct and, and there's nothing sort of uh, fraudulent about it. Um, in terms of the journal, we, we sort of operate I think in a similar way to uh, Professor Sakamoto does at PCP. So you know we, we pull papers through plagiarism check software, authenticate, um, and then we we just have um, sort of robust policies and procedures to, to handle any, any sort of queries which readers raise to us after, after publication or what reviewers raise to us um, during uh, peer review. Um, and of course, we'll consult the COPE Committee on Publication of Ethics, Committee on Publication Ethics Guidelines, uh, depending on the particular situation. It's really nuanced and there's lots of gray areas, but I think getting the original data, uh, as Professor Sakamoto mentioned, would be probably the first step that most journals would probably seek in that sort of situation um, and certainly encouraging people to be open with their data and depositing them in, in public uh, publicly available and accessible repositories is a, a really great thing I think and a sort of one one way in which we can go about trying to sort of address this this quite quite big problem um, <clears throat> yeah that's it for me and um, uh, just to finish, I, I will ask you to uh, to speak directly to the early career researchers uh, in the room now and also uh, in YouTube later on when we upload the, uh, the talk. And how would you invite them and encourage them to review for your for your journals? <laughs> Sorry, this was this one <laughs> was a difficult um... one. We, we have a strategy to recruit some of the young scientists, you know, uh, participating in the review process, but uh, maybe strongest one, I would say that uh, core review system so that, uh, you know, any kind of PIs just consider, you know, reviewing it together with your colleagues and then this kind of practice, you know, mentoring or practice would become very important for the community. So this is like a, you know, paid forward, you know? So mm -hmm. you, you, you really have to consider this as a part of the community and then just uh, sort of instruct them, you know? So this is that, that I believe that this is one of the important things. And, and I agree. <laughs> so who was Bennett? Mila? Yeah, I can go next. So was in a situation when I was an early career researcher in the past uh, doing my PhD and I wanted to know what are the benefits of being a reviewer as well and how to start and I've seen a lot actually uh, when I was reviewing I was more visible and I've seen the latest research actually coming uh, which is not published yet so I've been able to practice evaluate uh, the paper and have, use my critical thinking as well so that was really really useful for my career development and professional development especially if you work with open access publishers, you become really visible you can network you're part of the digital board you're not alone and these are all the benefits uh, which come in your way basically if you would like to start and you don't know where to start how to become a reviewer i would recommend you to reach out either to a journal itself to a digital team or to one of the editor of this journal and ask them uh, for any recommendation career advice 
what is their experience working with the journal um, and talk mm -hmm. before you select the journal you wish to, to collaborate with. So uh, these are the steps I would take uh, as an early career researcher. And that is great advice. So mm -hmm. Bennett, you want to end? Yeah, echoing a lot of those other points made by uh, the other panelists, but you know, um, so society-based journals really love to hear from the community and really want to engage with the community and support early career researchers. And, um, you know, I, I'd say, um, you know, reach out to, to editors of the journals you, you like and you've potentially possibly published in yourself already and flag that, you know, you're interested in reviewing for them. Um, you know, it might well be that some of your mentors, your advisors, supervisor, whatever it might be, might already be, you know, have an editorial role at that journal. So that's a nice sort of uh, way in if you, if, you, if you like for you to, to sort of uh, engage more directly with those sorts of places. Um, in terms of, yeah, as I say, for learning those practical skills to help you become a, a good peer reviewer, definitely speak to your, your mentors and your peers and sort of flag that, you know, you want to get more involved with peer review and can they maybe help you get some opportunities and some experience of doing that via co-reviewing with them um, and have that discussion. Um, and another practical thing I suggest would be to, to, to find the journals you're interested in and you, you can contribute to in terms of expertise and sign up to the um, manuscript submission system. Most journals will submit pay, uh, handle papers by an online submission site. And, you know, peer reviewers have to log on to that site to be able to participate in peer review. So as a very basic practical thing, I would get on those systems and sign up and make sure you fill out the expertise terms because uh, editors can then search for reviewers using certain expertise and you'll come up in searches so that's sort of a case of, you know, you've got to be in the runnings to be able to be <laughs> considered for a, a peer review and that will help you become more visible just um, on those systems. Um, so that's that's a couple of points which wants to flag, but um, yeah. Well, that, that was, that the last one was great advice, guys, uh, practical advice. So thank you, the three of you. Thank you especially to Professor Sakamoto for the very comprehensive introduction in what uh, the publishing process and the review process is. And that's all for today. Uh, um, uh, check your emails uh, in the near future for the, our next uh, webinars uh, and, and, and see you soon. Thank you for being here. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Mira and uh, Bennett and Isabel. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to stop recording. Bye-bye.